Americans can spend $90 billion in a single day of shopping. Last year, 200 million people swarmed their local stores on November 23rd. We call that day Black Friday. Did you know that a flu virus can survive on the surface of a banknote for up to 17 days? One day, there will be a pandemic. It could begin during the crush of Black Friday sales. A pathogen will jump from tainted banknotes to human skin, onto food, toys, children, and loved ones. By the time patient zero feels the first sore throat, millions of people will already be infected. Judging by the awards and nominations, the division is certainly one of the big, big hits here at E3 this year. It's gotta feel great for you as a studio to sort of come out, have the big coming out party and get this kind of reception. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, there's so much work f from every developer at E3 to get to this point. Not everybody is as lucky as us, so I, I feel extremely, extremely uh, grateful. But I'm also a boring guy. I'm already thinking about production because E3 is a competition in presentation, and I want to win the competition in game development, so that's different. So uh, I remember, I did. this is a memory I have from visiting your studio a few years back, because I've been hearing rumors of, of the big MMO that, that's been in the works at Massive. But I remember going into the story guy's room, and he had this bookshelf, and on that shelf there was like a meter of Tom Clancy books. And I asked him about it, and he sort of froze up a little bit. Has this How long has this game been, been in development? You should be a spy, you're good. So it, I, there are many ways to say that, but. The reality is we started talking with Ubisoft about this very early on when they acquired us because they had a couple of ideas that they wanted us to look at. And we had a couple of ideas of our own that we were prototyping and testing. And those kind of slowly gelled into one cohesive idea like, well, what if we do this and what if we took, you know, we put Clancy on there and we modernize it. Yeah, that would really fit with that. And that was something we started with early. But then we uh, started working on Far Cry 3 as well. And Far Cry 3 took a bit longer than we thought. So in reality, it was not until we were uh, ready to take people off Fort Cry 3 that we were able to put you know, the real push behind the division. So I think it could have come earlier, but uh, we had to do a great game in between. I mean, it's, it's also, is this the studio that you sort of, or the game that you've been building the studio to sort of create now? Is, is that fair to say? Well, you know what, it feels like that now. But I think the reality is, and many developers will say that, that you're always, um, it's not luck when it happens, because you're actively looking for everything to fall into place at once. But then when it does happen, it's timing, it's luck, it's experience, it's talent, it's people, it's network. There's so many things that kind of conspire uh, to put you in a position like this. So in a way, I could say, yeah, I've been working towards this 15 years, actually. But it, it, wouldn't, it didn't have to be this game. It's more the will to be at the very top and to compete with the best. Because we, we want to compete in absolute terms. You know, it's, we're not happy to be better than our own last game. We want to compete in absolute terms with the best, and that is really, really difficult. So what, what, what can you tell us about the Snowdrop engine, the, the engine that powers this? looks really impressive, especially when you consider that it's also an MMO. I think it looks just as good as, as any of the single-player uh, next-gen titles out there that we've seen. First of all, let me put it straight. It is running in real time, because we've been uh, questioned by a lot of people that what you showed at the press conference was not real. And I swear to God, that was the engine running in real time, live at the press conference. So the, um, we, we set that challenge to ourselves. We said, we don't want to show a movie. Let's show the game as it is. And everyone's like, oh God, you're taking too much risk. But we made it, and I think I'm really, really excited that we did, because it also forced us to push the engine to a level where it was able to do that with almost no risk, which is not, not easy. The, uh, what happened to us was we, we come from a PC background. So I think we made one of the most beautiful games ever on PC, which is World in Conflict. And I think it's being acknowledged as that by many others, so it's not just me bragging. Uh, and then we moved on to console, which was quite difficult for us, because the consoles in the current generation are very different from what we were used to. So that was a bit of a challenge. And then when we saw the specs for this generation of consoles, everybody in the studio was like, what, is this what I think it is? This is like the machine that suits our way of thinking with technology precisely, and both of them at the same time. So it's really like a gift out of nowhere, like, oh my God, is this next gen? Well then, you know, we're gonna be fine. 
So as soon as we saw that, we uh, just made a call to Paris and we said, hey, we want to sw switch our tech to next gen. And it seemed like a bit of a rash move at the time, but uh, we, I think we picked up on it very, very quickly and we put a lot, a lot of work in it. I, we're not ready. You know, if you think this is pretty, I say, wait, we're going to make it even prettier. So uh, were, you, were you aiming for PC at some point? Is that, is that what you were looking at for, for the game? Uh, the, I think the game has gone through some permutations, but the, our technology uh, is PC technology, really. So that's why uh, we were not that strong, I think, uh, on the current gen. And, and actually what we did on Far Cry and Assassin's Creed was on technology that was theirs, which is also difficult because it's much easier when the engineers created the tech, they know all of the you know shortcuts. Uh, but it was also like a university. It was necessary for us to make a game with Montreal and understand, you know, okay, so this is how you make a giant game on console. This is how you make a giant game within Ubisoft. So it was like the exam for us. But in the background, we were tinkering around with our own stuff. And then finally, we got the chance to do it full all in. That's this, that was what they were doing on the secret top floor that we were not allowed to visit. This is what we were doing on the top floor, yes. So, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that you're coming out on next-gen consoles and, and, and sort of that has that is of course what everyone's talking about here at, at, at the show this year what, what do you think apart from the technical side it is that sort of makes a game next-gen if you're talking about our game I, I think we have something that uh, I, I was hoping to see much more development on the narrative side and it, it's not the first thing that people think about when they say next-gen because normally you think okay better tech because that's what it is, it's new hardware, so by implication it's better tech. But I, I thought that we were ready as a, as a medium, as an art form, to also grow a little bit uh, in our way to tell, tell stories. Because to me, this generation of consoles is like a, a great canvas, but there's a, it's more direct between what you think and what you can do. With current gen, it's a bit like, okay, I want to do this, well, then I first have to build a brush before I can do that. But so with this generation, it's much shorter. So in theory, you're closer to your idea and what's happening on the machine. And I thought that was going to be like a leap in storytelling and a leap in narrative layers. And I don't mean I want to go all intellectual because we all like action. But I, I was expecting to be more surprised on that side. And my disappointment this year with E3 is that there's too much tech demos, too much water, fire, smoke, particles, explosions. And that's cool because we can do them and we can make them look better. But that's not where I want to see, that's not what I think is next gen enough. That is next gen, but that's like the bread and butter of next gen. And that's what I think we managed to bring to this E3, is a kind of an interesting narrative layer where it's not just, you know, I think it takes a minute and a half in our demo before any bullet is fired, which now in hindsight looks like a crazy risk to take. But we wanted to set it up, we wanted to, you know, create the location, create the background, create the setting, create the tension, make people think about why am I here, what am I doing, what is it all about, and then we get into the action, but the action is then put in a context that is a bit more meaningful. So, and I, I think we've uh, been gaining a lot of attention because of that. So, and, uh, and also I think it's one of those games where, where the environment actually tells a story, so you have to give the player that kind of, th that kind of thinking space, room to sort of look at it and sort of process what, what he's looking at. Absolutely, you're perfectly right. And there's another thing that we did that I think is very next gen and it's made possible, I think, a little bit by the capacity of this, these machines. And that is the removal of the 2D space. Because in a game you have the 3D, which is the world, and you have the gamer. You need them both. And what happens between them is the interactive experience. But for years and years and years we have added a 2D layer between them, which is where you're interactive too. And I always looked at that and thought, what is that 2D layer? Because it's not the game, it's not the gamer. So where does it exist philosophically? I mean, where does it belong? So I gave my guys a challenge on this one. I said, I forbid you to use that 2D space. We're never going to use it in the division unless it creates more immersion. And sometimes it can be an immersion improver. But normally it's just you know a glass between you and the game. And if you look at our game, everything that is UI is actually in the game world. So it, it's in there, it's not in a space between you and the game. And to me, that is another way to create better immersion and in a way, uh, more next-gen experience. Right, so uh, obviously you have some ways to go. What, what, what can you tell us about the production that's going on right now back, back home in Malmö? So what we'll do now is, now we will, I'm going to sound like a sports uh, man here, but what, what we're going to do now is we're going to celebrate this. 
But this is like the, the first win in a Stanley Cup final of seven games. I don't think anybody at Massive is uh, inexperienced enough to think that we have won. You know, we did a great first game, but we have many more to go. And that, that is, our, a lot of our attention is already thinking about Monday and how do we do that. I, I think inevitably there will be uh, an increase in expectations on this game, which probably means that there's an increase in expectations of what we should include in the development, which leads to a bigger team, I guess, or a, a more uh, um, extensive collaboration with another Ubisoft studio. So that's, that's what's on my mind production-wise, but it's really, you know, uh, don't get, don't, uh, we need to not stay in Cinderella land right now. We need to go back uh, to the coal mine, really, because that's what it is. Back to the coal mine it is. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much.